Um, last fall, I at the face to face with the PLC, we had uh, an opportunity to meet and talk about areas that we would like to find out some information. And one of the areas that was brought up, I believe, primarily from the uh, Calgary contingency, was. Um, auditory neuropathy. Who are these kids? What is auditory neuropathy? How can we best support them? And it took me a little while to find Beatrice, but I did find her through my connections with people at the Glen Rose, and Beatrice finally agreed to providing us with some information about auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. And Beatrice is at the Glen Rose Hospital as a temporary individual. And, uh, but a lot of her experience has been in, at the, um, uh, the, in Calgary, I believe at the Children's Hospital. And you can help me out with that, Beatrice, in, in, the, uh, in, in your introduction. So I'm going to hand over the um, the mic to Beatrice. Unfortunately, not the camera, and um, we can we can all learn something today. So thank you, Beatrice. It's for you. Oh, not at all. And uh, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's always good to to discuss this with uh, with everyone. Make sure we're all on the same page. Um, first of all, I'm going to apologize. I'm just getting over a cold, so if I mute suddenly it's because i'm coughing for which i apologize. <laughs> um so uh an overview of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder so basically um would like to kind of look at what exactly it is uh just oh, hang on there we go so just briefly about me um as you were saying i i I'm currently at the Glen Rose Re Rehabilitation Hospital as a temporary audiologist, but I spent a lot of my time at the Children's Hospital in Calgary, and um, we were seeing these children with this particular set of problems come through the clinic, and a lot of times we were struggling as to what to do with these kids and how to follow up with them and what services and what supports do they need. And um, and so while I do not at all claim to be an expert, I, I have seen quite a number of cases just from my time there. And I'm finding also with my time here up in Edmonton at the Glen Rose because oftentimes we see quite a few adults with this particular problem as well. Um, so just a brief overview. Um, so I'm just going to go briefly into each of these areas. So a uh, quick definition, what it is, um, a little bit about the anatomy involved, uh, how often it occurs, and what we do to assess auditory neuropathy and um, the sort of risk factors that you would expect to see and uh, the types of um, breakdowns in transmission of sound uh, that we would expect from it and what you would see yourself uh, uh, on the other end after we've found this pattern of results. And finally, um, the sorts of things that we would look to to try and support uh, some of these kids. <clears throat> so a really brief um, explanation of what this is, uh, a rare form of hearing loss where sound isn't transmitted um, from the inner ear uh, to the hearing nerve or from the nerve to the brain. Um, so this is probably the simplest explanation. Uh, what it is is just a breakdown in where the sound is transmitted or how the sound is transmitted um, due to a numerous uh, numbers of problems. So um, a quick little, this is the briefest history I could come up with. Um, so sort of in the 80s, uh, where a lot of those electrophysiological measures were being developed and in the 90s, um, they were noticing sort of a mismatch between their test results, so the behavioral audiograms that you would get versus the electrophysiological measures that we were finding. Um, and so the term auditory neuropathy sort of came about somewhere in the 90s. Um, after that, there was a whole proliferation of a whole bunch of terms and a lot of these terms were trying to reflect where that transmission difficulty had occurred. Um, in general, there are 
a whole number, more than what I have here, um, more terms than what I have here. But uh, in general, there are a lot of names out in the literature about this. Um, until around 2008, uh, this guideline development conference in Italy, um, it was sort of internationally agreed that the name used for this particular pattern of results would be auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. Um, so I'm just going to go back and talk a little bit about the ear. So I'm sure many of you already know um, or have seen well, should be familiar with the ear. Uh, so very briefly, uh, sound will travel through the eardrum and the middle ear system to the uh, nerve cells of the inner ear. And that's converted to electrical impulses that travel along the auditory nerve up to the brain. So you're probably already familiar with uh, conductive hearing loss, which would be problems with the eardrum and with uh, uh, or with the middle ear system. And sensor neural loss, which would be um, difficulties with the inner ear or the cochlea. Um, but for auditory neuropathy, what we're going to have to look more closely at is the inner ear and how it, as it connects to the auditory nerve and also how that auditory nerve uh, sends the information up to the brain. Um, so for this next slide, I'm just going to take a cross section of uh, the cochlea there. <clears throat> so this is just... Um, sort of a slice into the middle of the uh, inner ear. So um, uh, sound, sound pressure waves will come into the ear and it moves the fluid in the ear. And that in turn um, moves or stimulates the, uh, the hair cells. So you can see um, labeled sort of in that middle section there where that box is, we have outer hair cells and we have inner hair cells. Um, so the sound will stimulate those hair cells and transmit the sound to the nerve, which is that lovely yellow part of the picture, um, spiral ganglion all the way up to, up to the brain. Um, so this is going to become important later. There is a reason I'm going through this. Um, so the outer hair cells in general act to um, kind of amplify the sound. So there's a little or what they call a motor unit at the base of those, those cells. Um, so basically what happens is when your ear hears a sound, it actually makes that sound wave a little bit bigger because it contracts and it moves that whole section a little bit more. Um, the inner hair cells, uh, as far as I understand it, their function is to encode sort of the clarity or the resolution of the sound. And that is important um, to, to, to kind of send the information up to the brain and kind of give you that clarity of speech uh, that we're looking for. Um, all right. So overall, the technical definition of auditory neuropathy uh, would be um, normal measures of that hair cell activity or that inner ear activity. And we measure that with two different things, autoacoustic emissions and cochlear microphonic. Um, I'll go over those in just a moment. Um, and the other half of this is that the, the auditory brainstem response, so the electrical, electrophysiological measure of the nerve is either extremely degraded or absent. Um, so the general idea is um, part of the inner ear is intact, but that transmission uh, onto the nerve up to the brain is interrupted at some point. Um, and just keep in mind, this describes a clinical profile or, or a pattern of test results. Um, this isn't really a label for the child. Um, it's just a particular issue that was noticed uh, with a subset of children. Uh, we do have different tests to look at different parts of that inner ear versus the nerve, and we'll go over that in just a moment. Um, but uh, why we should be looking at this, um, so about one in 7,000 uh, has been noted previously uh, to have abnormal auditory nerve function. Um, I think uh, it's a relatively new diagnosis, but with the move towards universal newborn hearing screening programs, I think this is becoming uh, I think the awareness of this problem is becoming quite a bit wider because we know it exists and we're identifying it much earlier. Um, so 
uh, I think it's more kind of an awareness of a particular problem. So um, of, the, of the children who have permanent hearing loss, it's estimated somewhere between 7 to 10% of those kids have this particular pattern of results in addition to um, whatever other issues with hearing they might have. Uh, so I think that works out on average um, of children who have hearing loss. About 1 in 10 of those children will also have this pattern of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. Um, so I'm just going to move on a little bit as to how we um, measure or establish this pattern of results. Um, so the first thing I'm going to go over, um, autoacoustic emissions. Um, so if you recall uh, that photo of that inner ear, that cross section, we had those outer hair cells. Um, so basically autoacoustic emissions is a measure of, of the function of those hair cells. Uh, so with sensorineural hearing loss, autoacoustic emissions are absent um, because often this doesn't function with, with uh, straightforward sensorineural hearing loss. But with auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder in a fair number of these cases and we're finding different uh, rates of, of uh, present autoacoustic emissions, I think it's sitting somewhere between 60 to 75%. Um, oftentimes these responses are present at the beginning um, there is evidence that it disappears later on, uh, whether or not they use hearing aids, but at the beginning, they do have that uh, cochlear response that is um, that you can see. Um, <clears throat> so just moving on, I'm just going to move to the measures of the auditory nerve. So uh, auditory brainstem response, um, basically it's an electrophysiological measure of that nerve system. Um, so anytime you have uh, any sort of a nerve response, so be it muscle or any sort of sensory response, it creates an electrical potential, and that is something that we can read with an, our auditory brainstem response. So um, this is just a general definition of that. Um, so that ABR response, uh, it's generated in response to a sound. So the way we test infants, uh, very small infants, is to play um, very quiet sounds and force that nerve to fire and measure what level it takes for that nerve to fire. Um, <clears throat> now for, as I mentioned previously, for auditory neuropathy, um, what happens is that that, that uh, nerve response is <clears throat> either absent or it's only present at extremely high levels and it doesn't look the way you would typically expect it to look. Um, the thing to keep in mind with this auditory nerve response, um, it really just moves in one direction. So um, regardless of what the sound is that you present to the ear, it should look the same. Um, so for instance, if you have um, a, a clicking sound. Uh, okay, that's getting too complicated. So if you have, basically it moves in one direction. That, that was my point. <laughs> uh, so besides measuring auditory nerve function, uh, we can also measure a little bit of inner ear function with the ABR response. Um, and that is what we call a cochlear microphonic. Uh, so basically with uh, neur neuropathy, auditory neuropathy, um, what happens is uh, the normal waves that we would see in the auditory brainstem response are absent. However, we do see something at the very beginning. And what that response is, is actually the inner ear. So the nerve cells, or sorry, those hair cells in the inner ear also uh, create an electrical response as well. Now the difference between the the hair cells in the ear creating the response versus the nerve, the hair cells will actually reflect changes in the sound. So it basically can change direction. So this is how we show the difference between um, what we think a neural response would be versus an inner ear response. 
All right. So just to go through and uh, have a look at what a normal AVR would look like versus um, what that uh, inner ear cochlear microphonic response would be. Um, so on the oh, so just keep in mind this is not to scale at all. Um, so the the measures for the the left side are very different um, than the the right side. Um, the right side is actually blown up in size quite a bit. Um, so on the left side, we have what a normal um, auditory nerve response would be. So if you notice, um, there's a lot of, so there, and it's marked, um, so there's one, three, and five. So there are these peaks uh, in the normal ABR response, and those peaks correspond to different structures in the, ner in the auditory system. So, um, so for instance, uh, that would be sort of the auditory nerve and the back of the brainstem up to the top of the brainstem. So essentially that's what those peaks would represent or where those um, electrical responses are generated from. Um, for the abnormal AVR waves, uh, you notice that there's something that's really, really high in PV at the beginning, but the response sort of peters out and you're not getting this nice um, wavy response that you would expect. Um, so what that response is at the very beginning, this is not a neural response, this is actually a response from the inner ear, from either the inner or the outer hair cells from that inner ear. Um, and you can see the top two lines, um, the sound presented there uh, is actually exactly opposite as compared to the sound that's presented on the, the sort of the middle two lines there. So at the very bottom, they've actually stacked those two together, and you can see it creates this big butterfly kind of plot. Um, what that butterfly plot is telling you is that the response is actually from the inner ear. So in response to changing the, the sound that we're presenting to the ear, um, those hair cells in the ear actually change in direction as well. So it's giving us um, sort of an opposite electrical potential. Um, to each other. So it's sort of a nice double check for us to see if that part of the ear is functioning versus um, the neural part of the ear. Now, in a normal hearing ear, you still have cochlear microphonics. The thing is, the nerve response is so much larger that it actually uh, hides the cochlear microphonic response. The only reason you see cochlear microphonic response when the rest of the ABR is absent is because there are no other neural responses. So um, when we blow it up, we see this nice um, kind of opposite butterfly plot effect um, for when we're measuring that, that inner ear. <clears throat> so for this next slide, I found this photo of one type of auditory neuropathy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this is just one type of auditory neuropathy. So it's actually a cross-section of a normal auditory nerve on the left side um, versus an auditory nerve that is affected on the other side. And you can see the fibers on the, on the right side. There's much fewer as compared to the left. Um, so this is just one type. I just thought it was a little bit interesting to look at. Um, so looking at a few of the risk factors, um, I know there looks to be a lot of them. Mostly these fall into three main categories. Um, the first would be some sort of neonatal history. So hyperbilirubinemia or jaundice, high jaundice requiring transfusion. Uh, extreme prematurity, so below 28 weeks. Uh, low birth weight, oxygen deprivation, mumps, sepsis, meningitis, um, any sort of lack of oxygen to the brain will also, uh, or is also known to be a risk factor to develop auditory neuropathy. Um, and as you can probably guess, we see quite a number, like a number of cases, um, especially with that extreme perma, perma, extremely premature crowd, uh, just because of that lack of oxygen. So. Oxygen is always a, a huge problem when you have extreme, extremely premature children. 
when those lungs aren't developed yet when they come out, and so it just puts them at risk to develop this particular issue. Um, this, the second main set of, of causes or risk factors for autoturneropathy would be um, particular genetic conditions. Um, so as you can see, they have a few in there. So the, the OTOF uh, mutation, uh, sort of in the middle there, um, and that's actually specific to uh, a type of um, a transmitter in the inner ear. And then there are other ones that basically look at um, vestibular and, and auditory nerve um, issues. So it is known to be part of those particular genetic syndromes. Um, the other main category that you would see would be if there is something anatomically a little bit different. So, for instance, um, microcephaly, like a really small head, or uh, any sort of brain stem or abnormality, um, that kind of thing. Uh, just keep in mind, this isn't a comprehensive list of risk factors. Um, there are a whole host of other things that do lead, that do, that do serve as a risk factor for auditory neuropathy. Um, but this is just sort of a nice um, summary of some of the main ones that we see in general. So I just wanted to use the slide a little bit to um, show that based on the tests that we have, um, we can occasionally narrow down specifically where the sound isn't being transmitted, but the majority of the time we can't really rely on it because um, our test results have the tendency to look the same uh, for different areas of where the system isn't transmitting. Um, so we can't really we can't really depend on, on our pattern of results to say exactly where the issue or the, that breakdown in transmission might be. Um, because it would be similar uh, clinical responses for multiple causes. Um, so just as a summary to this, um, the main parts that it could break down, um, so this is just a list, so essentially uh, where the those inner hair cells are, um, where the auditory nerve, uh, how the auditory ner nerve connects, and um, and well, just essentially, just based on the tests we have, because we can't tell the difference between the causes of um, auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, we can't really predict how a child will will perform in a classroom setting or in day-to-day -day interactions. So this is why we call it a spectrum disorder and why outcomes for hearing might be extremely unpredictable. Okay. Um, so in general, what we would tend to do for for kids. Um, so if we're looking at below six to eight months, we would be doing those autoacoustic emissions and we would have those estimated levels from uh, the auditory brainstem uh, results. Um, now the problem with using ABR in that population, um, we don't actually know what level that child is actually hearing at. We know it's at least that level, but potentially it could be much better than what we're getting from that test. Um, now for children six to eight months or older, um, we, would, we would also do those autoacoustic emissions in ABR, but more what we would be relying on would be that behavioral testing in the sound booth, because where the child is actually responding um, would would really tell us give us an indication as to whether or not they're able to detect the sound in the first place. Um, so just to mention, there is some work that's being done right now, um, and it's it's very preliminary still, in using <clears throat> sort of later brain responses, so higher level brain responses, um, in determining sound differences to try and figure out what levels infants are hearing at. So in that before six to eight month crowd, um, that's the sort of thing we would be looking at. Um, it's not done in Alberta, uh, those tests in particular. Um, 
And I think, uh, from what I understand, it, it, they're still at the beginning stages of using those results to kind of determine hearing levels still. So um, it's still to be to be seen if this is going to be effective to tell where exactly the child is hearing at. Um, but still, I think we're still relying on that behavioral testing to, to try and tease apart uh, where exactly they are responding at. So that's the very young kids. Now for older kids, um, I forgot to talk about acoustic reflexes, but uh, there are uh, there is a middle ear reflex that relies on the function of the inner ear and the auditory nerve. And oftentimes those are either elevated or just completely missing in children with this profile. Um, behavioral testing could be anywhere from normal to profound in any configuration. Um, and again, that ABR is going to be relatively degraded or absent. And the thing to note, though, um, the word recognition or the speech discrimination would be much poorer than your audiogram would suggest. And the other thing you would see in the school age uh, population would be greater difficulties hearing when there's a lot of background noise or a lot of competing noise. Um, and that's, that's what we would typically expect. So uh, listening and noise requires um, very fine-tuned kind of timing cues. Um, to understand speech and to figure out where sounds are coming from. And if the nerve system isn't functioning optimally, then that kind of creates um, a bit of a disadvantage for that child. And that's where that difficulty kind of comprehending in noise comes from. Um, so that's with school age children. Uh, there is some preliminary research, research that shows that uh, for teenage years, so sort of mid to late teenage years, it looks like some kids with this profile, their behavioral thresholds actually get worse and their discrimination or rather their ability to comprehend speech um, also seems to decrease as they get a little bit older too. Uh, the causes of that aren't well known yet, but it's, it does seem to be a bit of a trend. Um, so just a bit of a conundrum. So. Uh, we have two audiograms here, um, and everybody here is um, probably versed with the audiogram. So um, uh, down the side, um, you've got your, your decibels or your levels of hearing, and across from left to right on that horizontal axis, you've got the different frequencies. Um, so just based on the audiogram, um, I guess the question would be, would you predict better or worse speech and language for one versus the other? I'm not sure if anybody has a particular opinion about that. Um, uh, from what from what I've seen previously, and from from what I've seen in in the literature as well, um, the the audiogram doesn't really tell you a whole lot. It tells you where they can detect environmental sounds, but it doesn't really tell you about how clear that sound would be or if the signal is reaching the brain in a fairly intact form. Um, so really the question would be, what does auditory neuropathy sound like? And the answer is we don't really know. I mean, the behavioral audiogram may be similar, or you might have sensory neural loss that looks very similar. But the sound quality might be different, very, very different for a child with this profile versus sensory neural hearing loss. So really, um, ABR and behavioral thresholds, so ABR results and the audiogram are pretty poor predictors of whether or not they're going to understand or, or they're going to, going to be able to obtain enough intact sound to be able to distinguish speech and language. Um, in some cases, uh, just as a side note, um, there was some previous suggestion that uh, those ABR, sorry, um, there was some suggestion that those ABR responses would improve, but the jury is sort of out on that. Um, it does seem to happen in some cases, and personally I have seen it happen myself, where 
the ABR does seem to improve, but generally it doesn't improve completely to normal from what I've seen. Um, I, whether or not that actually happens, it, it's still to be seen. Um, behavioral thresholds, there is also some question whether or not those behavioral results will also improve. Um, and really the jury's out. Um, there's a lot of literature and I mean, that that is something that is, um, that is thought to be uh, the case in the UK, but um, I know in North America, I think they're moving away a little bit from that because I think um, the idea was that some of those uh, initial tests, uh, ABR tests for neuropathy were perhaps uh, not as clean or maybe a little bit noisier, so you can't really um, evaluate some of those responses as you would expect. So just as, um, uh, I guess, a little bit of a, a simulation, I did find an interesting sound simulation of auditory neuropathy. Um, so because we don't know what quality of sound the child is getting, there might be complete distortion or it might be just like a little bit blurred out. Um, so uh, what this simulation is looking at, it actually presents extremely distorted sound and it just gets comparatively clear. Um, so with any child with that profile of auditory neuropathy, we don't know where they are in terms of that clarity spectrum. So uh, this is just sort of nice to illustrate um, the level of distortion that might occur. So uh, hopefully everybody has their sound on. <laughs> And that doesn't seem to want to work. Okay, never mind. Moving on. Um, if anybody is interested, I can send the link to that uh, sound simulation another time. Um, So this is just an analogy to vision um, because I had a feeling that uh, the sound clip wasn't going to work. Um, so I best guess, guess for some some children with auditory neuropathy, I mean the sound might be a little bit blurred, or there might be big huge holes in what they're hearing, and really we don't know which end of it they're on um, or what precisely they're hearing. It might even be even more degraded than what you're seeing on the screen right there. So because we don't know precisely where they are on that uh, clarity scale, um, the idea is that no single approach works for every child with this profile. Uh, so some will benefit from technology such as hearing aids or cochlear implants. Um, some might need a combination of like visual communication and spoken language. Um, if they are using hearing aids or cochlear implant or cochlear implants, um, just that listening technology is going to be very important, and I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Um, so, really, from what I've seen in the past, and from what uh, a lot of the literature um, states, like you might start with one approach, and then you have to change just depending on what's happening with the child and whether or not they're hearing enough clarity to be able to develop that speech and language. So as you can probably imagine, um, auditory neuropathy, this, inquire, this requires a complete management team. So uh, this is just an example. So pediatric audiologist, um, you would need like the diagnostic, the assessments, uh, educational audiologist, of course, uh, private practice or um, the fitting or, or dispensing audiologist. Um, pediatric ENT um, and, and neurology, uh, usually they would need to do some monitoring and to see if there are other, um, other issues involved with uh, the auditory neuropathy. So uh, oftentimes our auditory neuropathy doesn't occur necessarily in isolation. It can occur with other types of neuropathies as well. So um, uh, a lot of that though is dependent on uh, what the initial cause or etiology would be. Um, of course, you definitely need a speech language pathologist on board, um, mostly because we need to monitor 
that uh, speech and language development, or rather they need to monitor that speech and language development, um, particularly that speech and language trajectory, because we need to know that the child is obtaining enough information with uh, whatever intervention they have to develop that speech and language. And if they aren't, then that's where we're cued to switch, um, switch gears and try to, try to find another way to, to support the children. Um, and of course, uh, the teacher and the classroom support is very important because oftentimes uh, uh, children with this profile need a little more support. Um, so uh, other professionals that you would probably have on this team would be social work um, and psychology. Um, the psychology in particular, because you, at some point, you would want to look at that nonverbal learning ability of the child, and particularly if that child hasn't uh, progressed in speech and language as, as you would have expected. So then you can separate it from language versus um, uh, there any sort of cognitive delay as well. In terms of um, interventions and mode of communication, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, so a lot of the, the um, interventions are really determined by what we see from the child. Um, again, that progress, so the monitoring is really important there. And, uh, and really what the needs of the family would be. Um, so uh, every, every family, every case is going to look very different. And really, we need to take this case by case. There isn't a cookie cutter method that is going to work for every child with a particular profile. <clears throat> now, um, with, with interventions, I'm sure probably wondering how effective something like hearing aids would be. Um, the current recommendations uh, for, um, and I'm blanking on, it's in the States, the American Academy of Audiology in the States. The current, current recommendations would be uh, to trial hearing aid technology if that behavioral audiogram is showing that they're, um, the levels that they're responding at are insufficient to support, to support um, normal speech perception. Um, so this is particularly important um, to give it a go because, uh, you know, a lot of times, like, yes, amplification outcomes may be mixed, but a lot of kids do show quite a bit of progress with hearing aids. Um, so it's really that, uh, that, that constant monitoring um, to really determine whether or not they're, they're holding their own or whether or not we need to switch gears. Um, you know, I mentioned briefly before, uh, especially with have, how the nerve transmits up to the brain, those timing cues and, and the, the, I guess the clarity of sound is not the same as what you would expect. Um, so I'm going to come back to come to this in, in the next couple of slides. Um, we do know that children don't, with auditory neuropathy do not do as well in noise. And so uh, I just wanted to briefly mention that there are different um, types of technology, does, like hearing aid technology out there to manage that background noise more effectively. Um, so you do have diff those different levels of technology. So you have your entry level, your mid, and your high. And I'm not saying you need to go high level to get those noise management features, but oftentimes a lot of those um, sound management or noise management strategies aren't really available in the basic entry level technology. So um, basically what I'm saying is for kids who are undergoing, for neuropathy, um, kids who are undergoing hearing aid trial, they really need to have a good conversation with whoever is dispensing um, the hearing aids just to see what would be appropriate in terms of trying to manage that background noise problem and, and seeing what their options would be for that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, I did find a nice little kind of summary study of uh, comparing children uh, who have that profile of auditory neuropathy versus 
um, sensory neural hearing loss. And so uh, this particular study was uh, looking at children who were identified via universal newborn hearing screening programs in the States. And this is across multiple centers. Um, and they matched the kids based on hearing levels, um, so audibility, um, age of identification, um, uh, gender, um, a degree of hearing, as I was saying, degree of hearing levels. So the nice thing about this study is when they looked at these kids, uh, they followed these kids out um, for quite some time. I think it was three to five years. And as they were measuring different parts of language and speech and language, they were finding that there really wasn't any significant difference between um, the children with that auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder versus the sensory neural hearing loss. Um, so all these kids had hearing aids at about the same age. They were identified at about the same age, and they have about the same levels of audibility. So um, as you can just glance down that column of auditory neuropathy or the ANSD, um, so that compared to the next column over, those differences are not significant. Um, the thing to note, though, at the very bottom, uh, so what that start section is, um, that last data point, uh, they didn't have enough numbers to, to really compare those two. Those were just based on, I think, about six children um, in total between those two groups. Uh, but it is an interesting trend. So what that last line is showing is that when you try to do word recognition with a little bit of background noise, um, it looks, the trend was that the auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder that the kids with that profile do much worse when you put a little bit of noise in there compared to the children who have uh, sensory neural hearing loss. Um, so the next slide I'm going to, to show actually goes into that a little bit further. I don't know if that's coming across very clearly. Um, so basically these are, uh, it's sort of a, a speech sound perception test. And so they compared, um, so down the left-hand side, you can see they compared um, children who have normal hearing versus children who have sensory neural hearing loss and children who have auditory neuropathy. Um, and uh, each column, so you have the uh, SN ratio and the SN, um, that's called the signal to noise ratio. So uh, the plus 20 dB, um, mo pretty much everybody with normal hearing, uh, you can see with the normal the, nor, uh, the normal hearing children in the study, um, they were getting 96 or high 90s uh, in the particular test. So the noise level at plus 20, um, basically that means you have 20 decibels over and above how much noise there is. Um, so the, the performance of, of uh, children with normal hearing at that level is really, really good. And see children with sensory neural hearing loss do quite a bit poorer than children with normal hearing. But then when you look at the auditory neuropathy grouping, it drops down to by half. And so you can see the effect of noise where for normal hearing subjects, it really doesn't impact them at all. For children with auditory neuropathy, it really drops their ability to comprehend speech and language. Um, and it is significantly different. Um, especially in that first column. Um, the difference is as you, as you go down, so you have the plus 20 decibels and then you have the plus 10, which means that there's a little bit more noise as compared to the signal. You can see there's still, like the normal hearing children are still doing quite well, but the sensory neural hearing loss uh, drops even further, but the neuropathy group is starting to really bottom out there. So how noise affects this particular population is pretty dramatic. Um, so what that means in terms of what we do in the classroom would be to try and give them as good a speech signal as we possibly can. And that's where FM systems or direct microphone systems would come into play. Um, so to kind of overcome that huge drop in noise that children with that profile have, um, FM systems are really, really important, and it really gives uh, a child with this profile who is probably dealing with 
an al already really degraded signal at the best of time. It sort of gives them the best chance of catching what you're saying um, to kind of give them the best support and the best chance of succeeding. And I'm not sure if my sound clips are going to work, but if they do, it would be nice. <laughs> and no, they're not going to work. If anybody would like to hear these clips, I can send them to you. But basically, it was comparing um, what it sounds like with a hearing aid only in a noisy classroom as compared to what it sounds like with a hearing aid combined with a directional um, uh, FM system or uh, uh, a direct microphone system, and, and it really is very dramatic. Um, so, and that's just with uh, your typical hearing aid use. This isn't even adding the distortion that you would have with um, a child with that auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. Um, so, those are the kids with a hearing aid. So, those are mostly mild, moderate um, uh, kids. Um, the children who behaviorally respond more in the severe to profound range, uh, we would be monitoring them much more closely for something such as cochlear implantation. And, um, and this occurs in a handful of cases, not the majority of auditory neuropathy cases. Um, so in cases where the hearing aids and FM systems aren't enough to provide uh, the child with enough information to develop that speech and language, and I mean, if the parents really want that audibility in the hearing, then we would move to possibly considering cochlear implant. Um, and so again, that close monitoring of that speech perception and, and the audibility and the development um, is also very, very important. Uh, um, so some of the, just as a side note, some of the, um, the studies of children with auditory neuropathy who have had um, <clears throat> cochlear implantation, um, just as compared to sensory neural hearing loss in the severe to profound range, who also have cochlear implantation. Um, when they compare across those two populations, auditory neuropathy and sensory neural loss, they do end up looking very similar in terms of <clears throat> their language outcomes as well, um, which is sort of nice. Um, why that is, it's, it's sort of difficult to say, but some of the theories would suggest that uh, a cochlear implant provides um, more, um, more stimulation of the nerve, and so it creates a stronger response to travel up to the brain, which gives the, the child more information at that level. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Okay, so in general, um, I'm sure you're wondering how best to help students. Um, so of course, um, the educational ideologist to make sure all of the equipment is um, working at optimal levels, um, checking the equipment regularly, and encouraging that regular follow-up and equipment maintenance. And again, just wearing that uh, personal microphone system or FM system, um, that is the best thing you can do with this particular population. Um, in terms of that, that follow-up, I mean, with younger children, uh, we would want to follow them quite closely, so probably at three to six month intervals. Um, School-age children, I mean, at minimum, they should probably see, be seen about once a year, if not more, um, even more if, uh, if, if there are changes in hearing or changes in how the children are performing or, or hearing. Um, <clears throat> of course, I mean, those are just minimum sort of follow-ups. Um, and I mean, to private practice, you would expect to see them at least twice a year, regardless of your age, um, just for regular equipment maintenance. <clears throat> so just to summarize really quickly, um, auditory neuropathy, this is a label uh, or for a pattern of test results for the child. Or sorry, this is a label for a pattern of test results and, and not a label necessarily for the child. Um, and so um, that absent ABR at the very beginning, it doesn't really imply profound hearing loss necessarily. Um, we really just have to uh, 
closely monitor uh, the, the child because they might not respond in a predictable kind of way. Um, many children with neuropathy or with this profile are able to make good use of their hearing. <clears throat> and uh, in general, you just can't predict um, uh, how so early on when we're still trying to figure out those behavioral thresholds, we can't really predict at a later stage how they're going to be, how they're going to, how their outcomes will be. Um, so we really need to do as much as possible to monitor and support the kids um, at early stages. And uh, the other component of this is just establishing that early communication and language. Um, and if they're deviating off of that trajectory, um, that's, that's, that, that's our cue to really step in and try to figure out what are the supports they might need in place. Um, so that is about all I had planned. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, Beatrice. Thank you. It's, it's Sarah. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually ask the question because it's something I'm interested in, and I'm wondering in your preparation of this um, um, interesting topic, if you came across whether any auditory training for these kids with this diagnosis um, helps support them in utilizing whatever technology they were, um, uh, you know, in test results. Um, benefiting from? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> and no, I didn't see anything in particular with this population, but I do know that um, there is an effect of training in children with sensory and neural hearing loss. Um, and a lot of that is top-down processing. So, I mean, you would sort of expect that any sort of auditory training would kind of help them in the long run, um, but that isn't something that I, I've seen at all in the literature. If anybody else has, feel free to jump in. Any other questions? Hello. 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 Any hands up or any chat? You can do either one. Hi, Beatrice. Hi. Yeah. Oh, hi. My name is Amy. Um, I have a student. Uh, he's in grade three. He has a mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss and plus auditory neuropathy. Um, right. And I know the school is working really, really hard to support him. Um, he's having he's having a lot of difficulties even with number recognition, you know, if if you say like count one to 10 and then count backwards, it's hard for him to get the numbers in order from one to 10, even like, and he's at grade three. Um, right. So the school is struggling. Um, he has occupational therapy and speech language therapy services as well. And we're just trying to work together as a team to figure out, you know, is there something else happening here? Would, would the auditory neuropathy be contributing to some of these issues do you feel or i know it's hard to say if, if you don't have the bigger picture but um like is there any research kind of that well kind of support that i think this is where that multidisciplinary team really comes into play um you kind of um you would in general from what i've seen in the past you would need to look at their nonverbal kind of cognitive ability to do that kind of thing. And then you would have to look at the speech perception part of it as well. And the language. And I know, yeah, and I know his speech perception thresh, threshold, uh, it's excellent in the right ear and good in the left. I think 98% and 80% based on his last hearing test. So would that be words in quiet or? Uh, let me just see, I actually have a support here. I believe, yes, in quiet. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and, okay. So if speech perception in quiet is that good, um, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming he has the language to comprehend. <clears throat> yeah, you know, like speech-wise, but when, I mean, his reading levels are quite low as well. 
Right. But, right. Um, Can I it, ask Beatrice, sorry, it's Sarah. Would you request a, a speech uh, speech recognition and noise from the audiologist to mm -hmm. get a better handle on? Is that would that provide some additional information for Amy? Um, that might give you a little bit of an idea of how they're performing in the classroom. I would think. Um, I guess my question is, uh, if uh, his nonverbal cognitive abilities um, are at that level or if it's the hearing specifically. It's sort of hard to tease this apart without all the pieces of the information. Yeah, for, I, yeah and I know uh, the occupational therapist did some uh, visual kind of spatial testing with him and he did quite low on that. Okay. I can't remember the name of the test. I might have that down, but yeah, and I know he's struggling in those areas. Right, right. Um, in all honesty, it, it is really hard to say. I mean, uh, having that auditory neuropathy profile probably isn't helping matters, but mm -hmm. whether that's the sole reason for the difficulties he's experiencing, it, 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 it's really difficult to tease that apart at this stage. I mean, he probably needs a little bit more, more evaluation to try and figure out each part of this a little bit more for him. Okay, that's kind of what we thought, but I, I figured, oh, I'd ask just to see. Maybe there was a, <laughs> a magical answer, but we, we thought that maybe further testing or maybe even an ed psych evaluation or mm -hmm. something along those lines to see if there's another piece that we're maybe missing. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Beatrice. I appreciate it. Not at all. Any other questions? Okay, so Beatrice, I just I'm, I keep thinking back to somebody who said actually I think it was Karen Anderson who said um, if you've met one child with hearing loss, um, you've met one child with hearing loss. I think we can also add if you've met one child with hearing loss or uh, auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, you've met one child with auditory ASND or ANSD. Um, and so I uh, I really appreciate you giving us this foundational information, it allow, allows, it contributes to our practice out in the field and, you know, we'll continue to have conversations about kids and individual children in order to best meet their needs. And uh, thank you again for agreeing, even, and it's, I think it's the second person that's presented with a really bad cold in the last few months. So um, I'm not going to talk to anybody anymore because apparently I have something I'm spreading. So. <laughs> Have a, have a um, great rest of the day. Everybody stay dry, and um, see you next month, everybody. Thank you.